colossal possum. I don't understand, like, ugh, and he's down. <laughs> So I recently created a pair of polls asking you what your favorite Xenarthrans are. And since YouTube only lets me create polls with four options if there are pictures included, I had to split the extant and extinct members of this clade. On the extant poll, the armadillos won by a pretty wide margin, which I guess isn't really surprising, since the internet has collectively decided that tree sloths are the worst organisms cooked up by nature since the koala and anteaters are basically armadillos minus the armor. But then we get to the extinct Xenarthran pole, which is obviously my bread and butter. And the winner was hands down the ground sloths. And I guess this love of the ground sloths kind of comes from the same place as our dislike of the tree sloths, since ground sloths are pretty much everything that modern sloths are not. What did surprise me is how poorly the Pampatheers did, however considering they're basically roided up versions of what you all said was your favorite extant member of this clade. Seriously, look at this guy. He's bucking up to a jaguar. But I guess I still get it. Ground sloths are pretty amazing. So amazing, in fact, that their disappearance would have a significant effect on the world. Even more so than many other animals. And that was originally what I was going to talk about today. But then I started seeing a huge amount of interest for the fourth option in that poll. The dreaded Killer Dillos, also known as Macro Euphractus. Many of you were shocked by the existence of a version of our beloved tactical assault possum becoming a violent killer. But in fact, for one branch of this family during the Miocene, that is exactly what happened. And I want to talk about it, because even among this very unique clade of mammals, this creature is truly one of a kind as well as this being my opportunity to show a little appreciation for the last remaining group of armored mammals. And now, I'm going to upset some people. For you see, as many of you know, I spent about four years in the exceedingly proud state of Texas. If there's one thing that I've learned during my time there, it is Texans have a lot of pride in things being Texan. And in fact, they seem to be very protective of the idea of keeping Texan things Texan. It's a very big deal to them, and it's why 99% of you probably don't even know what a Whataburger is. And one thing that I saw that I thought was really cute was how the image of an armadillo was the symbol of something being native Texan, or true Texan. They put it on t-shirts and bumper stickers. They've even selected the armadillo as the state small mammal. And I find the choice to make the armadillo the poster animal for all things Texan particularly funny. Because if you know anything about armadillos, or at least in their natural history, you know that these animals are actually migrants from Latin America. Before the land bridge formed between North and South, there were no Xenarthrans at all in North America. This means that prior to around 3 million years ago, we have to travel to South America to find any evidence of their existence. So going back to the Miocene, we see the continent of South America completely isolated for several million years. And every time this happens, we see fauna that starts to radiate in interesting new directions. South America and Australia both kind of became evolutionary experiments, creating wildly unique fauna. We've talked about some of these different animals before. This would be the home of the Sebeckid land crocs who were dominant at the time. There were caviamorph rodents related to the capybara and guinea pig, notoungulate herbivores, the early terror birds, and the last of the metatherian sparacidont carnivores like Thylacosmilus. And, of course, a great many different forms of Xenarthrans. Sloths had already started to diversify by this time, as did armadillos and glyptodonts. One of the primary differences between armadillos and glyptodonts, in addition to the fact that armadillos have more flexible shelves, while glyptodons have harder, stiff, rigid shells, were that glyptodons were devout herbivores, while armadillos tended to have a more varied diet, many of them were fully omnivorous, with a heavy preference for insects. But there was one branch of this family that were able to make a living hunting larger prey. 
a genus of the Euphractine armadillos, a group that today includes the hairy armadillos, the dwarf armadillos, and the six-banded armadillo. But as the name suggests, Macro Euphractus was by far the largest member of this subfamily, with three known species ranging in size from comparable to a badger to a small bear. In fact, these would be the largest armadillos that we know of that isn't a member of the Pampathir or Glyptodons. And we call it a killer dillo because of several features found in a particularly well-preserved skull. The teeth are peg-like, which is similar to all armadillos, but they were sharp and seemed like they would have been good for gripping. And the skull also has a very well-developed zygomatic arch, as well as an enlarged temporal fossa. These structures are usually seen as adaptations for strong jaw muscles that normally comes with a very powerful bite. Something that we don't generally associate with Xenarthrans. And with all these other predators around, it seems like it would be an odd choice to join and start competing with them directly. There was certainly a lot of different prey to go around, but why on earth would an armadillo choose to compete directly with things like terror birds and sebecids? Well, the truth is, Macro Euphractus was probably responding to a decline in many of these different animals. As we talked about in the history of the land crocs, the Sebecids were one of the last of the old guard of terrestrial archosaur predators. But by the middle of the late Miocene, even they were on their way out. And for the most part, we don't see fossils of the carnivorous killer dillos until after the land crocs had disappeared. When an apex predator of that caliber goes extinct, there is going to be a power vacuum. The Sporacidonts and Forest Rockets remained a little bit longer in the cooling and drying climate of the Miocene, but their populations were weaker than they had been previously. This was likely the opening that Macro Euphractus used to its advantage to carve out a niche as a carnivore. And it also helped that this animal was probably going to be hunting very differently than its competitors because it managed to maintain a lot of its more classic Xenarthran traits from its more humble ancestors. It was still well adapted for a fossorial lifestyle, meaning they live primarily, but not solely, underground. It could use its ability to dig as both a way of hunting as well as a way of hiding kills from other predators, which is a theory that could explain how it managed to survive alongside a massive terratorn vulture like Argentavis. If I was to describe what I think this animal would be like in life, I would compare it to a 200 pound honey badger wearing a suit of armor. It wasn't as fast as the terror birds, but it could dig up the burrows of smaller caviamorph rodents and trap them. And it probably didn't shy away from scavenging, using its powerful jaws to crush bone and feed on carcasses. And if those carcasses had carnivorous birds feeding on it, they would be quick to aggression to run them off, and most hollow-boned birds would not want to get bitten by this little dirt terror. After all, a broken wing on an Argentavis, or a broken foot on a Forest Rockus, could be a death sentence. When you look at it like that, it's not quite as surprising that an armadillo could become a killer. But it does beg the question, if this animal was so hardy, why did the killer dillo not survive to the modern day? There are moments in natural history that have such a profound effect on life on Earth that we can see in the fossil record that in this one defining moment, everything changed. Oftentimes, these are marked as the effects of a catastrophe, after which a noticeable drop in global biodiversity shows how few different species managed to pull through. The Siberian traps being linked to the Permian mass extinction and the Chicxulub crater being linked to the KPG mass extinction are the two most notable examples of this. But especially as we get closer to the present, it becomes easier to see the effects of more localized events. One that given many more millions of years of time may not be as obvious. One such event took place between 2 and 3 million years ago, with the formation of the land bridge between North and South America. This would be the first time that South America was directly connected to any other landmass in tens of millions of years. The continent had been entirely isolated for so long, and the animals were so specialized to the complex ecosystems that they had built among themselves, that the introduction of invaders from the North was the worst possible thing that could happen. 
But regardless, the Pandora's box had been opened. In an event that we call the Great Biotic Interchange. Suddenly, it was possible for animals that had never encountered one another before to see each other for the first time. And with that, competition was about to ramp up. Cats, dogs, bears, pigs, horses, and camels all made their way south. And to make things even worse, the bridging of the Americas also had a profound effect on the global climate, since any ocean currents that passed in between the two continents were now cut off. This led to the climate being pushed even more towards the cooler, drier world that was yet to come. And all this meant that things were going to get much tougher for the South American native species. Some, like the ground sloths, glyptodons, pampatheres, small marsupials, and other armadillos, would manage to spread north as the Pleistocene began. Even a few species of terrorbirds and toxodons. But one that would not be among them would be the killer dillos, who were last seen in the fossil record around 3 million years ago. It is not completely known if it was the changing environment of the time or competition from North American animals that pushed Macroeuphractus to extinction, or maybe some combination of both. But what is clear is that, one way or another, the killer Dillo was one of the many casualties of these two different worlds on a collision course with each other. And unfortunately, we would not see anything like this bizarre creature ever again. The ecological upheaval that we see in the Americas during the Pliocene is one of the most interesting events in the Cenozoic era. It's one of the final pieces of the puzzle of our world becoming the world we know today. Just like how we don't think of the nine-banded armadillo or the Virginia opossum as not being originally North American animals, we don't think about the fact that so many of the animals that live in South America today have only been there for a few million years. The jaguar is seen as the top predator of the Amazon, but three million years ago, no cat had ever set foot on the continent. The top predator roles were filled by bizarre animals that were able to step into that niche. Although there are armadillos in North America today, the close relatives of Macroeuphractus never spread north as far as we know. And in fact, South America remains as the home of the overwhelming majority of different armadillos. And all Xenarthrins. And that's why I love observing nine-banded armadillos. They are one of the very few South American migrants from this tumultuous time in our planet's history who have managed to hang on in North America. So I don't think I'm going to call this a paleo catalog video. For whatever reason, those videos are not performing as well as some of my other stuff. YouTube seems to think it's something to do with my thumbnails, I don't know. So this is going to be an experiment to see if the algorithm will be more generous to this if I posed it as a question video with a different title and thumbnail. But this is basically going to be a stand-in for one of those. If you enjoyed this, make sure you give it a like. And comment below to tell me what other topics you would like to see me cover. I will tell you that I do definitely plan to talk more about the Great Biotic Interchange more, but that's definitely going to be a major part in the History of the Earth series when I get to that point. Anyway, that's all I have for today. Have a good one, everybody.